This is my review of the Ruby Official Manga Chapter 12. And once more, I just freaking love this series. I really wish the uh, main series of Rime just to follow this more closely, but yeah. This just gives Roman Torchwick more oomph. Like, I'm reading him in this chapter, and he actually freaking terrifies me. He is a straight-up monster here, instead of just the... I mean, I know in, like, the main series, he was conniving, twisted, mocking of all those around him, but here he's just straight-up villain, straight-up sadistic, and I freaking loved it. Anyway, a yeah, chapter starts off with, you know, Torchwick's uh, auto-targeting function has been uh, broken by Sun and Neptune, that was whole last chapter. So his uh, rockets, they aren't that effective anymore. Can't really hit their targets all their all that well. And then we start seeing the team moves, which I absolutely love. Oh, I really miss this when the team split up. Freezer burn! That's uh, Yang and Weiss somehow combining their semblances. Next up, uh, Ladybug. That's just Ruby and Blake trying to basically cut him in half. And this actually kind of impresses uh, Torchwick, which I like. I thought them nothing more than a bunch of preening show-offs, but you're practically a full-fledged huntress, Little Red. <laughs> wow, that's respect from Torchwick. I did not expect to see that ever, really. Seriously, even if Ruby, you know, saved the entire freaking world, killed Salem, Cinder, and brought about world peace, I still suspect Torchwick would just mock her like, oh, she's just still Little Red. But here he's, you know... Telling her, hey, we're in, I'm impressed right here. You're almost a full-fledged huntress. Good for you. And now that he's been weakened, their plan is to use basically the same thing they did take out the uh, Nevermore, the cannonball attack, where they uh, essentially combine all their skills. You know, Weiss is holding her back using her glyph. Uh, Blake's string is being used, her weapon, which eh, not that much for use of her, but whatever. And, uh, finally, Yang launches it, punches full force, sending Ruby flying. And they get, this is it, they won! And then you see Torchwick's face. And it is freaking terrifying. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this man looks not even human right here. And as he says, seeing the looks on your face makes you want to keep playing until you break. As he launches just a crazy number of missiles all at them, which... Basically knocks them all down or out or whatever. This, of course, isn't the end for uh, good old Torchwick's sadistic side as he then pins Blake to the ground with a with his giant freaking robot hand. Literally, I thought he had broken at least a dozen of her bones right here. Even with Aura, there's only so much that can do. And, uh, yeah, so then he just starts mentally tormenting her. Tell me something. Did you truly believe you had what it took to stop me and your brethren? You, a girl who betrayed her old allies just to assuage her own guilt. You set aside the mask of the White Fang and poser that you are, don the mask of a huntress. Behold, your rash actions have once again gotten your allies hurt. Allow me to be clear, no matter what you do, it won't erase your past sin. You'll never be any sort of a hero. This is weird to me. This is just really, really weird. I mean, this is essentially, you know, the justification she uses for running away at the end of Volume 3. She doesn't want to get her friends hurt, and here Torchwick is basically rubbing that in, setting the groundwork for it, but at the same time, she overcame it here. She said, no, with my friends supporting me, I know I can be a hero. I know I can stand up. I know I can do it. So, I mean, Blake leaving a team is something that I think a lot of people in the community are still just not happy about, not okay with. They don't like how it was done. They don't like her motivations, her reasoning, which she didn't really explain all that well in any of that. And yet this right here is her reason. She doesn't want her allies getting hurt. She wanted Adam going after them. Instead, she wanted you know, him focused on her and her alone. Even if it meant him killing her. In a way, it also just really amplifies the terror that Adam induces in her. I mean, here, Blake is literally being held down by a giant-ass robot. All her friends are passed out, and... Yet she still has, you know, the strength to keep moving forward, to keep going. Yet when Adam does it in a few volumes, in a couple of chapters at this point, uh, it's going to shake her so much that she flees. She just leaves everything behind and essentially goes to her own death. That's really freaking terrifying. 
Anyway, then uh, Yang shows up with her hair literally on fire. It just, she looks freaking amazing here. I love it. And screams out, get the heck away from my partner. Which I know, you know, she's referring to their partners. They, they've teamed, they teamed up in the whole trending thing. But shippers are just going to love that line so much. You know, seeing her friends helping her, it reminds her, you know, she says, I have people pushing me forward. People took my hand and asked me to walk with them. With all of them here for me, I can become the real deal. And, and again, one of the reasons I think the manga just does it so much better. We feel the partnership, the friendship, the essentially family between these four so much more. As they're saying, you know, she's saying that she believes that with them, she can grow. She can become better. She can do more. Become the real thing. Become a real hero. Just because she has them on their side. That's not something I could ever seen a uh, main series Blake saying for quite a while. Honestly, even now, I don't think she could have even said it without it sounding corny. But here, it just feels right. It makes sense. Anyway, then Ruby and Weiss use Ice Flower to uh, freeze Torchwick in place, giving Blake and Yang the chance for some Bumblebee action <laughs> as Blake literally spins her around as a freaking top. So that she can uh, build up speed and smash right into Torchwick. Of course, he fires back with his own shot, but uh, that's not going to work because, as she says, uh, Yang converts damage into aura. So she, so his attack literally just made her stronger. <laughs> really, yeah, I love it. And then there's this shot of her smashing into him, hair aglow. She's every bit the dragon that uh, they say she is, and I absolutely love it. And once again, we just see how more, how much more dangerous this Torchwick is. The main series, you know, Neo comes in and uh, helps him escape. This one, he's still planning on fighting. His robot, his giant death robot was destroyed. And yet, and yet he's still planning on fighting all four of them by himself. As he says, shall we take this to its conclusion? He's really planning on killing them here, even though he's outnumbered and outgunned. I mean, Neo literally has to come in and tell him that, you know, he's running late with his other appointments, so he has to get going. And, oh my god, the look she has on her face right now is absolutely freaking adorable. Irk Neo is the most, is the cutest thing I've ever seen in this entire series. Love it. Makes a weird Cinderella reference. The clock is about to strike midnight, so our ball must come to an end. I leave behind my glass slipper, so to speak. As, you know, Neo uses her whole illusion powers to hide their escape. But yeah, he had no intention of fleeing, no idea Neo was on her way, and seemed surprised when she showed up, so... That's, uh... That, that's, again, that, it's just so freaking terrifying that he literally thinks he could out, outgun all of them on his own. Anyway, then we move back to the, uh... The bad guys. Cinder, Mercury, and Emerald. Though... Mercury does say something interesting, saying that the only thing they need to sneak in were these disguises. Where in the, uh, you know, main series, they get, I mean, they get Lionheart, one of the headmasters, one of the foremost people, foreign people on the entire freaking planet, to write them fake transcripts so they can sneak in. So does that mean they're unofficially recognized as being students, and if, you know, they look too closely, they'll find out, hey, you're not supposed to be here, and stop them, or what exactly is their plan going forward? Also, Emerald just is so annoyed with Mercury and really wants him to shut up. There was a uh, line's a little concerning. Don't be like that. You'll miss my sweet voice when I'm gone. So, death flag for him? I theorize that in the upcoming volume, he's going to die saving her somehow. But that'd definitely be interesting if the manga foreshadows something that's about to happen in the main series. And Cinder says something very interesting. A fortress standing tall in the name of a false peace. Can you hear it, Osbin? The sound of your lies falling to pieces. I mean, this could really be like the first hint of a backstory, like this false peace is referring to how people outside the walls, they suffer and they die repeatedly. And, uh, you know, being forced to live inside the walls would basically just make you a slave to the rules and the laws there, so it's not real peace. I remember One Kingdom, uh, I forgot which one, basically tried to say, Okay, no one can have any art, emotions, or anything, and that way the gram will stay out of our hair. So, I mean, that. At the same time, now after the war, they were all about, uh, you know, color. Every, that's why everyone's named after a color. Ruby, Weiss, Blake. It was all color, you know, 
everyone else basically all have color-based names because after the war they were all trying to be pro color and emotion and art and all that so I don't think that's be the... and again though there I'm I'm, ran, I'm I'm rambling a lot here I'm sorry but all right uh, there was an attempt to build another civilization outside the walls and there are other people who live outside the walls who repeatedly face the grim face the all that maybe Cinder's plan is to I don't know, stop the Grimm once and for all, but she's working for the basically the Queen of Grimm, so... It just feels weird, this line. I mean, this isn't something she's saying to rile people up or manipulate them, or it's part of her story. This is something she's saying to herself, essentially. So it feels like this is deep meaning to her, but let me know what you think in the comment section down below. What did she really mean by the false piece? Is, just, is she just referring to the whole war with Salem, or is she referring to something deeper, something... More about how the world currently operates. And that was uh, chapter 12. Really good chapter, like I said. Definitely amped up Torchwick's uh, evilness quite a bit, which I liked. Uh, next chapter is November 26th. Uh, what's going to happen next? Okay, this is around the time where Blake gets really, really depressed and essentially cuts herself off from the rest of the world, but... I can't see them doing that anymore, just with how Blake has been established as a character here. You know, she keeps saying, I can do it because I have friends supporting me, and that's just totally opposite of who Blake was at that time. Though, unless I'm mistaken, though, we haven't gotten the uh, backstory where, it, you know, Yang tells Blake all about her mother and that whole thing. I'm actually really excited to see how they do that, because that's going to be interesting. And it could be, you know, Blake just starts overworking herself here now, but doesn't really separate herself from the team. Like, she's still, you know, part of the team, still active with them, but they can tell she's exhausted, she's tired, she's working too hard. So Yang pulls her aside and tells her the story so they can, so that she can realize that there's a danger to trying too hard, to looking too hard for answers. For Yang, it was almost the death of her and her sister. But I do just really want to see that uh, flashback as Yang tells the story, because... This wasn't actually official, but in one of the Ruby anthologies, or the last Ruby manga, I forget which, there was just this amazing scene where, uh, no, it was definitely the last Ruby manga, where Ruby, or Yang, it was definitely the last Ruby manga, where Yang, uh, when she was attacked by the Grimm when she was a kid with Ruby behind her, she stood up and told Ruby, it's okay, your big sis is here to protect you, your big sis will keep you safe. As a freaking 10-year-old child fighting off the Grimm, she's still assuring her sister that she'll be okay, that everything's going to be okay, and that, that's just one of my favorite things in all of Ruby right there. I mean, that's basically what inspired Ruby to become a huntress, you know? Wanting to protect people like her big sister protected her then. Uh, and also the school dance afterwards, which would be interesting. Ruby, <laughs> oh god, the cross-dressing John, that's going to be, uh... That's going to be something else, but yeah, let me think down below. What do you think about Cinder's motives? And what do you think is going to happen next chapter? Be sure to like, subscribe. Till next time. Peace. Peace.